Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Dom from Lens Pro To Go and Lens Rentals. Welcome back to the channel. So what you see here in front of me today is the Pictor Zoom Cine Zoom lens set from our friends over at DZO Film who have been cranking out some really impressive cinema glass recently, so excited to do this little two-part series on these Pictor zooms. So, if you saw it last week, I did a video reviewing this 50 to 125 millimeter T2.8. So now this week, we're gonna check out the wider of the lenses in this set, the 20 to 55 T2.8 Pictor zoom. And just like in last week's video, we're gonna start off by going through the physical characteristics of this lens like the build and the design choices and stuff like that. And then we're gonna talk about what's going on inside of this lens in terms of like optics and optical design. And then we're gonna check out a couple of tests I was able to do here in the studio so we can get an idea of like how this lens performs optically and also check out some of its characteristics like it's out of focus area, flaring and glaring and all sorts of fun stuff like that. And all that test footage you're gonna see in this video and in last week's video was taken on this Blackmagic 6K Pocket Camera Pro. And I'll throw a lot of those parameters for these tests in the description below if you wanna check that out. So I went into a little bit more depth about this Pictor Zoom set as a whole in last week's video, but just as a refresher in case you didn't watch it, but also like check it out. These Pictor Zooms are a really affordable option for a Cine Zoom set when you're butting them up to other options from other brands out there. Like the Sigma Cine Zooms and the Fujinon MKs, both fantastic Cine Zoom sets, but those are both encroaching on like the $8,000 plus price tag range, where this set is going to sit at like a very approachable $5,200. And there's still constant T2.8 lenses, super 35 millimeter coverage, thoughtful design, par focal on both lenses. So this is a really big undercut in price for the caliber of lens that they're competing with here. Also, one thing I forgot to mention, these lenses at first glance might look like they have an identical form factor, but this 20 to 55 is actually slightly shorter than the 50 to 125, but you'll be glad to know that once they're actually attached to the camera, those gears align in the exact same place, and that makes switching from lens to lens way easier, especially if there are Sydney lens accessories involved like a fizz unit or a matte box or something. So that's like really, really nice. These lenses have an interchangeable mount, which is very easily done just by unscrewing these seven screws right here at the lens flange. And it can change to several other mounts, including Sony E, L mount and PL mount. But today I'm working with the EF version of this lens and there are small size and weight differences when going from mount to mount. But currently as an EF mount, the lens weighs 3.35 pounds and is 6.76 inches long, six and three quarters basically. And other than those differences, it shares basically all of the build and design features of its sibling, the 50 to 125 minus the optics, of course. It's got a nice solid lens support down here that's removable if you want. On the front of the lens, it features an 86 millimeter filter thread for a thread on ND filter or a CPL, which is really handy. Although 86 millimeters is kind of an uncommon filter size. Also at the front here is this little taper up at the end of the lens barrel, which actually brings that last half inch or so up to a 95 millimeter outer diameter, a much more compatible size for matte boxes and also the same as its Sigma Cine competitors. In terms of looks and feel, it's got a pretty average shape that just sort of tapers down to the lens mount pretty evenly, and the gears are spaced out evenly as well. All of the markings on this lens are in this neon yellow color, while the focal length numbers and this make your movie slogan on top here are in white. The metric and imperial increments are split up on each side of the gear of the focus ring, where feet are on the outside and meters are on the inside. The focus ring has a nice smooth pull and rotates 270 degrees from close focus to infinity. And close focus on this lens is 24 inches exactly, so two feet. So a bit closer than the 50 to 125 millimeter, which is two feet, eight inches. The zoom ring has a bit more resistance to it too, and about 90 degrees of throw. And the focal length markings go in five millimeter increments. So like 20, 25, 30, 35, etc. The zoom ring also has these four little threads for a little zoom knob extension that you could put on the top, bottom, or the sides. Finally, the iris ring, which has the most resistance of all. Really nothing to report here other than, on this copy anyways, it's pretty stiff to pull. 
You definitely won't be making any accidental iris changes on this lens just by a small little bump to the iris ring. And minor detail, the iris and zoom ring share this same little marker line in between here for the two of them. All right, moving on to what's going on inside this lens. We have a 16 aperture blade diaphragm at work here, and this is going to keep that bokeh circular throughout the whole iris range, as opposed to creating hard geometries like what happens at certain stops sometimes. And we're about to see examples of that in a second when I go through the entire aperture range. So one thing I didn't talk about at all in last week's video on the 50 to 125 millimeter was distortion because at that focal length range, there really isn't anything to talk about there. But on this lens, the wider of this lens set, we're definitely going to start to see examples of barrel distortion, especially as we get down towards the 20 millimeter focal length here. This isn't a proper distortion chart, of course, but it gets the job done. All those squares are exactly the same size, and the black border between all those squares is also the same size from edge to edge, so no funny business going on there. Here you can tell that things clearly get pretty distorted around the edges at our wide end of 20 millimeters. A good place to look is right at the edge of the frame on either side, but I like the right side of the frame a little bit better for this. And you can see how that distortion gets significantly less exaggerated as we creep in on the focal length. Okay, so with that out of the way, now we're gonna check out a couple of these tests. And first we're gonna check out a couple of chart tests where we're gonna look at things like sharpness and chromatic aberration. And then we're gonna check out a little characteristic test I did where we're gonna check out the out of focus area and the bokehs and also how this lens flares, both at 20 millimeters and 50 millimeters, both ends of its zoom range. And then I'm also gonna play with changing between T2.8 wide open and T4 a little bit so we can see the difference there. You ready, Kyle? He's ready. Okay, here's a chart test where we will check for sharpness, chromatic aberrations, and ghosting. And we'll start out at 20 millimeters, then check out 55. So at 20 wide open T2.8, it's definitely noticeably softer near the edges when compared to the center. But this is actually fairly common for this wide of a focal length cine lens, especially a zoom. What I would be concerned about is that small amount of ghosting and the little green magenta chrome ab going on there, but it seems pretty tame. At T4, things get a little bit better, but honestly not by much. I noticed stopping to T4 did sharpen things up, but only by a hair. The real difference is that T4 seems to reduce the ghosting and chromatic aberration to a nearly unnoticeable amount. Okay, at 55 millimeters, we are looking super good. Really good sharpness from corner to corner. Really no optical flaws to speak of, like ghosting or chrome ab. And also, we are safely out of the barrel distortion range here at 55 millimeters. And real quick side note here, this is a really good example of the distortion. You can see when I switch really rapidly from the 20 to 50 millimeter shots how apparent that is. Anyways, at 55 millimeter T4, things get even sharper. We're getting even more contrast, but also T4 reveals that this lens, at least this copy anyways, has some frame-wide chrome ab going on that skews the left side a bit blue and the right side a bit red. Okay, this next test is for longitudinal chrome ab. And here at 20 millimeters, I had to zoom into the image a little bit here in post so you could even see the chart. But you can tell at T2.8, this is managed really well. No color change noticeable at all as I rack up and down this little chart. However, at 55 millimeters, you do get some, and it seems like the longitudinal chrome ab here is on the Kelvin scale, sort of, where it's like cooler on the far end of the focus plane and slightly warmer just before it. Okay, finally, here is our characteristic test, and currently, we're seeing the 20 millimeter lens test, which is a bit different than all of the other focal lengths I've done in this series, because Kyle's head here was basically right at the close focus distance, so the quarter and the red light I was using as a close focus point are just gonna be like foreground elements that create a bokeh. I can't like focus to them. So we are at about 26 inches away from the subject here, and we're getting a decent amount 
of pop from the background, which is only a few feet behind our subject here. So this is like really close quarters, but still looking good. And as I start to pan over, that wide angle distortion becomes much more noticeable. Everything that moves towards the edge has like a subtle warp to it, including Kyle's face here as that gets stretched towards the edge a bit. Not horribly though. The lens flare at this focal length is really busy. It catches very easily, and right at its strongest point, we get a lot of green reflections that form a prominent beam across the image. And some of those orbs get really in focus in the center, which I could see possibly being a distraction. However, look at those foreground bokehs move across the image. They have a really nice sort of like twinkle there. And now the light source is really direct, so you have this lens flare at full force creating this big circular arc around the whole image and a warm glare in the bottom corners. All right, as you'd expect at T4, things get a bit more tame. Aside from the obvious exposure change, you can tell that the bokehs get much smaller, but they also find a much more circular shape when you stop down to T4. This is especially noticeable with those foreground bokehs too. Also, the orbs that make up this beam in the lens flare get smaller too, and some even disappear, but some also get a bit sharper at T4 too, so it's like less noticeable in one way, but more in another. All right, last thing for 20 millimeters, we're gonna check out the whole aperture range, and this is a good showcase of how those 16 iris blades keep the bokehs at all stops smooth and circular. And also notice the star geometry that the light source takes as we stop down to T22. All right, before we check out the 50 millimeter on this lens, let's take a look at a few shots that demonstrate how this lens is parfocal. As you can see, I'm zooming over the whole range here and this focus plane is completely unaffected. Very nice. Okay, let's check out 55 millimeters. Here our subject is at about five feet three inches or 1.6 meters. And I think this is a lovely distance ratio for this focal length. We get such nice separation from the background and the out of focus area is really blended, like oil painting-esque. The bokehs actually aren't very uniform at this focal length though. Even these near the center are quite a bit cat-eyed and distorted. And as I mentioned at 55 millimeters, we are out of that range of being worried about barrel distortion. I'd say that gets safely tightened up at like 30 millimeters. So when Kyle moves over to the edge there, the shape of his face stays put. When I do this pan at close focus, notice how the flare fades out when the light source gets out of frame, and then it puts on this little light show in the corner as it exits. A lot of stuff going on there, like this large red blooming reflection right there, which is cool. And then it turns into the direct flare where we get that beam again. Not as bad as the 20 millimeter beam, but still a full beam. All right, the difference at T4 here is pretty much the same, but it does help the bokehs a lot at this focal length. They have a much better chance of being totally circular here at T4. Also, the lens flare gets a bit more tame too, and we're getting more contrast out of the image at T4 than wide open. Although that beam I've been talking about seems pretty unaffected. Finally, here is the whole aperture range at 55 millimeters. All right, so that's pretty much gonna do it for the lens test from this 20 to 55 T2.8 Pictor zoom. 
So now let's review what we learned about this lens today. And also keep in mind that this is the wider zoom from this set. You're gonna get a lot less weird and funky problems with this focal length range, the 50 to 125, than you are with this wider one. You just introduce some of those characteristics like distortion and stuff as you get closer to like the 20 millimeter focal length range. So yes, there's obviously some visible distortion at 20 millimeters on this lens. And at that wide of a focal length, it's also not perfectly tack sharp from corner to corner, which is totally fine. The important thing is that it's very consistent throughout its zoom range. A 20 millimeter shot can have a very similar characteristic to a 125 millimeter shot on the next lens up. So I guess my main takeaway is that it's amazing to have a cine zoom lens set that covers a focal length range of 20 to 125 millimeters. They have a consistent look throughout. They're all T2.8 at every focal length range. Each lens is parfocal and they're very easily interchangeable on like a really built up video rig that has like a Fizion and Mapbox and such. So honestly, I would recommend this Pictor Zoom Cine lens set to like a maybe a small production company that really, really wants to get their hands on a set of Cine Zoom lenses, but did not like the idea of spending like $10,000 almost to get there, probably after taxes and shipping and accessories for those lenses and stuff, so. Just something to think about. All right, everybody, so that's pretty much gonna wrap it up on this video and also this small series of videos. It was, it was a series of two. A series of two videos on this Pictora Zoom lens set from DZO Film. So, as always, if you have any questions or insights about either of these lenses or you have in the past or are currently working with this lens set, let me know how you like them in the comment section below and we'll start a discussion. Also, if you happen to like this video, hit it with that thumbs up button down there to let me know you liked it. And if you're not already, subscribe to the channel. But if you are, you can actually hit that little bell button down there to get notified whenever we post new content, which is every week. So take care and we'll see you in the next one. Ah, interesting, yes.